Welcome to our study of the Book of Romans. My name is Michael DeFazio. I'm a professor of New Testament at Ozark Christian College, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity to serve as a guide as we work our way through this book. I always approach studying Romans with a combination of excitement and fear because Romans should change you. Me too, for what it's worth. By considering what we're going to be doing together, uh, unpacking Paul's letter to the Romans, we should by no means finish this journey exactly the same people that we are today. We should know Jesus more clearly, understand the gospel more thoroughly, uh, pursue grace more passionately and feel it deeply, hate sin more completely, and understand more fully than we ever have before the large story of God's purposes for the world and his faithful achievement of those purposes in spite of evil and sin. Yet studying Romans should change you. And I say this with great historical support because Romans has been changing people and changing the world for centuries. In the fourth century, Augustine of Hippo was a famous teacher of rhetoric and a pretty successful person. His mom was a faithful believer in Jesus and she prayed for him a lot, but he was not a person who walked with Jesus. He was living a pretty, pretty rampantly immoral life, enjoying all of the pleasures of success and the things that go along with it. And one day he was at a party and he just was feeling the weight of the world and his own life and his own, what his mom called sin, and he just had to leave. And he ran out of the party and he sat down underneath a tree and he wept. And as he wept, he, he heard nearby uh, this song. It sounded like children playing a game. He was not familiar with the game, but what they kept saying was, take and read, take and read. And so he went and found a Bible, opened it up, and turned to Romans chapter 13, 14, a verse that talks about putting away the misdeeds of the flesh and putting on Christ. And he felt that God was calling him and saving him, and he changed. He became one of the most prolific writers and influential thinkers in, in history of the church. Fast forward a while, uh, in the 15th and 16th centuries, you have Martin Luther, a monk who tried hard to please God, but he was tormented because he believed that his sin was the only true thing about him and that God was only judging him all the time. And if he was honest, he hated God. And he hated reading books like Romans because he'd read about the justice and righteousness of God, and he understood that to only mean that he was being punished. And he studied Romans deeply in those years, though, and came to realize that he had been wrong. And he found in Romans that God's righteousness was not just God judging him, but God saving him. This idea sparked the Reformation. Fast forward a couple hundred years and you have one John Wesley walking down the street. He was a Christian by name, but not on the inside, at least not according to him. And he was walking along and he heard a group of followers of Jesus inside studying Romans. And they were reading, but they weren't even reading the text. They were reading the preface to Luther's commentary on Romans. And as he listened, he stopped and heard the words that they were saying, the words that they were reading about this great book, Romans. And he said in his own testimony that at that moment, he felt his heart strangely warm. And he felt that he did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. These kind of stories could be added to because this is the kind of things that Romans has been doing. This is why John Chrysostom, one of the great preachers in the early church, would have Romans read to him twice a week. This is why Martin Luther says in that preface to Romans that all followers of Jesus should not only know Romans by heart, but should deal with it daily as with daily bread of the soul. This is why John Calvin says that if you have an understanding of this letter, this epistle to the Romans, then you have a light and a window into all of the scriptures. This is why not just theologians, somebody like uh, the great poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge says, I think that Paul's letter to the Romans is the most profound book in existence. People say these kinds of things about Romans because Romans changes people. And it does so because it answers the deep questions that you and I are asking, whether we recognize it or not. Questions like, can God be trusted? Can I count on God to be consistent, faithful, changeless? Is he who he says he is? Will he keep his promises? Uh, questions like, how can I be made right? How can I be put together again? How can I be saved? And even if you're not a religious person, even if you don't ask these questions in religious terms, you ask them. We all are looking for, for something perfect that we can count on and depend on and rely on, and we all are looking for a way to be put back together again. Romans answers these questions, and the answers will change us. A few words about our approach to Romans. Uh, we're going to walk through the text, all 16 chapters, but we're not going to go verse by verse. We don't have the time to look into all the details. And so my goal is to say enough. Can't say everything and that's fine. I want to say enough. Enough 
to spark your thought, help you think things through. Enough, if you're reading this in a group, to generate conversation and discussion to help you talk things through. Really, my goal is to say enough to send you back to the text of Romans, back to your open Bibles, knowing more than you did before so that you can open up the scriptures, look deeply into them, and find, through the help of the Holy Spirit, uh, what you're looking for. So we're going to um, go through this and try to say enough. And because there's a lot in there, we're going to take kind of a zoom in, zoom out approach. Sometimes we'll just be talking about bigger sections and I'll explain big picture what's going on. So it's kind of important that you read it uh, before and after. At times, though, we'll zoom in and look at particular verses that uh, kind of represent the larger things that are going on in those different sections. As for right now, what I want to do with the rest of our first session is to look at the introduction of Romans and to see if we can't get a grasp of the purposes for why Paul wrote this letter. We're going to look at three primary purposes by focusing on chapter 1, verses 14 to 17. Now, there are probably four purposes. There's another one. Uh, probably part of what Paul's doing is trying to raise some support for future ministry, but we'll talk about that later. The three primary purposes come from uh, these three verses, or these four verses, 14, 15, 16, and 17. So let me read them and then unpack them a little bit. Paul says, uh, I'm obligated both to Greeks and to non-Greeks, both to the wise and the foolish. That is why I'm so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are in Rome. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, and then to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness from faith to faith, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. If you unpack this, you see the three primary purposes to this letter. Now, the first one uh, thing that Paul is trying to do is he's trying to clarify the gospel. This is why Paul wrote this book. This is what Paul wants to do, is clarify uh, the gospel. Now, no matter what you're doing in life or whoever you're deciding to be, there are certain things you just, you just kind of you kind of need to have in place. You kind of need to know. If you're, uh, you're going to wait tables, you kind of need to understand that your job is to get the right food to the right people at the right tables. Uh, if you're going skydiving, you kind of need to know ahead of time which one of these levers releases the parachute. And if you want to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus, kind of need to know what the gospel is. If you want to be a church, a real, true, faithful church, this is 101. You got to get the gospel and you got to get it right. And Paul's writing this great letter, which is his most comprehensive um, laying out of the gospel that he preaches, the gospel that God has revealed to him as an inspired apostle. If you look at these words, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And then he talks a little bit about what it means. The gospel is the power of God for the salvation of all who believe. So let's just look at some of these words and uh, see if we can't start to understand some of what Paul's saying. So you have the word gospel, and then the gospel is the power for salvation to all who believe. Now, this is just a quick overview. He's going to unpack these things later. And if, as you read this section, as we talk through it, you feel a little bit like, okay, I'm just a lot of details, kind of lost in the details. That's okay at this point. It's kind of like when you go see um, like a historical site, and often before you go through and see it, you'll sit down and watch a tour of video, which is supposed to prepare you for what you're watching. When I'm in those videos, I sometimes feel like, okay, like I don't understand everything you're talking about because I don't have any context for it because I haven't seen the thing yet. Let's just get started. So this is kind of like Paul's tour, uh, early tour prep video. He says the gospel a word that means good news or good report. Good things have happened. Events have taken place that mean good things for you. And for Paul, his gospel looks backwards to the book of Isaiah, where God promised through this prophet that good news would be preached when God took back control of his world and, and, and righted the wrongs and, and delivered his people. Looks back to these promises in Isaiah, and it looks forward to really the Roman media, they would use this word a lot. It was kind of a political word. They would use this word to describe the glory of Rome and the greatness of Augustus and other great leaders. And they now run the world. And this is good news for you for these reasons. So that's, that's gospel. Paul says in his gospel is the power of God for salvation. So this gospel does something. And what it does is it saves people. A salvation just means um, made whole again, put back together, healed. Kind of a medical term, actually. And it is salvation that comes to all who believe. 
Uh, put your faith in Jesus, put your trust in him, put your confidence in him. Now, as I said, we'll unpack these things as we go, but what Paul wants to do, first of all, is clarify the gospel. That's not his entire purpose, though, or that's not all of it. It has a practical bent to it, a practical edge to it, and that's the second purpose that Paul has in mind as he writes this letter, and that is Paul wants to unify the church. This is um, kind of easy to skate past, but you don't want to if you want to understand Paul's purposes. Paul wants to unify the church. He doesn't just say this the gospel is the power for salvation to all who believe. He adds a line, first for the Jew, then for the Gentile. If you've read Romans, you've noticed this, and if you read it, you'll see it over and over and over again. Jews, Gentiles, Gentiles, Jews. Why? What's the story? Well, let me tell you the story of what was going on in the church in Rome in the mid-50s when Paul wrote. If you back up a little bit, in the late 30s is kind of when it begins, Christianity in Rome. It comes, the gospel, Jesus, comes to Rome almost entirely through Jews who have heard it elsewhere and, elsewhere and are bringing this good news that God sent the Messiah. So the church starts and begins to grow. They evangelize, they share the gospel, and people come to faith. And mostly Jews, also some Gentiles. So there for a while, you have this church growing probably actually over a decade, and uh, most of the people who've been following Jesus the longest are Jewish Christians. Most of those who are in leadership positions, probably Jewish Christians. Church has a Jewish flavor, a Jewish style to it. Then something happens, though, in the year 49. The emperor expels all the Jews from Rome, probably because the Jewish Christians and the Jewish non-Christians were, were arguing. He said, just get out of here. Now, we don't know if all of them left, but enough did to make a difference. And at this point, the leaders are gone. And the Gentile Christians are looking at each other going, what do we do now? And they continued doing church, but their church took on a decidedly Gentile flavor. The Gentiles were now in leadership. And they didn't change everything, didn't change the message, but they changed some of the rituals and practices and the things that they did. About five years later in 54, there's a new emperor, and he lets the Jews return. They're glad to come back. And the Jewish Christians come back home to their home church, which doesn't look like it used to. Now, there are some differences. And you've got one style of following Jesus and another style of following Jesus, and they've got to find a way to make the two mesh. Now, I don't think that they were divided, but there was tension. And Paul writes this letter in probably about 56 or 57 to try to unify the church. So he's clarifying the gospel with a practical purpose in mind. It's the first two purposes. But the third one is also present in this text, and it has to do with this idea of the righteousness of God. Paul is writing to prove God's, uh, we'll just put an R with a circle around it to represent righteousness. That's what Paul's doing. He says in, in the last part of that section, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. What is God's righteousness? Well, righteous is a word that just means you meet a standard. Like it's, it's, it's as good as you expect it. It meets uh, what you want it to be. So like you talk about, you know, a wave is righteous or you talk about behavior is righteous. It, it is what it's supposed to do. That's what they're supposed to do. They did it. It's called righteous. And what does it mean, though, when it comes to God? He doesn't have any outside standard that he has to meet. So it's the standards of his own character. And in Romans as in most of Scripture, there's two elements to God's righteousness that Paul wants to talk about here. The first one is, we'll call it his integrity as judge. God is the judge, and he has to have integrity as a judge and to punish wrongdoing and reward good. That's a judge's job. Can't be impartial or you're no longer righteous, no longer just. Uh, another element to this, though, is uh, faithful. God has integrity because he conforms to the standard of his own integrity. And for God to be righteous also means that God is faithful because God's made promises. And for God to be righteous, to meet the standard, he has to meet the standard set by his own promises. And so if God promises that he's going to save the world through Israel, which he did through Abraham's family in this one particular nation, this is going to be how he reaches all the other nations. If God promises this, then he has to do it. And if he doesn't do it, then he's not righteous. So when you read in here that in, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, we're talking about this legal aspect of this and also the covenant aspect of this because Jesus was something of a surprise. And on the surface, kind of looks like he's letting people off the hook. On the surface, kind of looks like he's maybe going outside of the Old Testament and doing something different. So Paul writes uh, to demonstrate the consistency of God's character and his plan from Old Testament to New, from the beginning of time to the end.
So, those are Paul's purposes in writing Romans. Prove God's righteousness, unify the church, clarify the gospel. Those seem like some pretty worthy goals to me.